All right, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's really a pleasure uh, for us all to be here tonight, uh, especially for those joining us. This is a very special evening. This is a very special event. Uh, this is the first event in our series, uh, our speaker series around Black student activism, uh, issues of racial justice, deconstructing anti-Black sentiment, and of course, racism at Columbia University. Uh, the purpose of tonight is to serve as an introduction to past and present day Black student activism. Uh, what we've done tonight is carefully selected a set of a couple panelists who we hope you enjoy. And we're gonna be engaging both the panelists and of course you, the audience, in a discussion on the purpose and the impact of student activism, its relevancy and the most effective ways to get involved. Uh, one of the main things, uh, Ada the Jewel chapter founded here June 5th, 1909, and of course the uh, mighty Row chapter, who we cannot forget, who has been serving Harlem for the last 97 years, founded December 7th, 1923, I wanted to make sure I got it correctly, uh, made sure that we did is by receiving the racial justice grant. Uh, we realized this was a unique opportunity to engage with the students of Columbia University and provided much needed context and nuance, of course, the conditions and the environments that encourage racial inequity. This panel serves as the first installment in a speaker series dedicated to engaging the students of Columbia University with purposeful discussions about anti-Black racism. Uh, following this, we wanted to make sure we also did a land acknowledgement because we acknowledge the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Lenape people on which we learn, work, and gather today at Columbia University. Lenape means real person or original person, and it is important to remember that the Lenape collectively are a living and breathing community. Tonight, we honor their legacy and we commit ourselves to the struggle against the forces that have dispossessed the Lenape people and other indigenous peoples of their lands. We stand strong in our commitment tonight to support and defend all marginalized groups of people of this land who have been stripped of their rights to self-determination. Moving forward, we wanted to make sure that we introduced our moderator tonight. We're so ecstatic to have Dr. Basil Smickle Jr. Uh, now, although uh, a couple people around Columbia University may know who he is from his adjunct teaching, uh, we wanted to make sure we, we offered him a proper introduction. Uh, so Dr. Basil Smickle Jr. is a professor at Rutgers University in New York in the School, School of Public Affairs and Administration. And he also lectures at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs and Teachers College. He has also been named campaign manager uh, for Ray McGuire's campaign for mayor of New York City. With over 15 years in higher education and 25 years of a career dedicated to public service, Basil regularly shares insight on electoral politics, governance, and public policy on national media outlets such as MSNBC, CNN, and Bloomberg TV. Basil holds a PhD in politics and education and an MPA from Columbia University after receiving, of course, his Bachelor of Science from Cornell University. In the midst of racial unrest and healthcare crisis brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic, Basil has become a leading voice on criminal justice reform, improved ballot access, and a big proponent against voter suppression. During the last few months, he has moderated or joined discussions with national civil rights leaders, members of Congress, and local advocates to educate the public about opportunities to mobilize around the most pressing issues of the day. A direct result of his leadership on these issues, Basil co-teaches a class at Columbia University with New York State Attorney General Tish James, entitled Rethinking Policing for the 21st Century. From 2017 to 19, Basil served as the Distinguished Lecturer of Politics and Public Policy at the City University of New York School of Labor and Urban Studies. Prior to that, he was appointed by Governor Andrew Cuomo and former Governor David Patterson to serve as the Executive Director of the New York State Democratic Party where he was the second highest ranking Democrat in the state. Basil has worked closely with elected officials and community leaders to manage electoral and fundraising strategies for the state. He recruited candidates for political office and worked closely with the Democratic National Committee to create grassroots mobilization programs and act as a party surrogate during the 2016 cycle. Under Basil's leadership, Democrats flipped county legislatures and countywide seats, laying the foundation for returning to state Senate to full Democratic control in 2018 and flipping three congressional seats. He received awards from Governor Andrew Cuomo and New York State Comptroller Tom DiNapoli for his commitment to public service 
and education equity. In addition, Basil has served as a senior aide to Hillary Rodham Clinton on her Senate staff, where he advised Senator Clinton on statewide policy and politics. His work and collaboration had a substantial impact on the state of New York, and Mrs. Clinton herself has called Basil a key advisor and tremendous public servant who makes sure all voices are heard. A lifelong New Yorker and raised in the Bronx by Jamaican immigrants, shout out all my Jamaicans, he's inspired by his father, a retired textile worker, and mother, a longtime public school special education teacher. Brother Basil is also a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, Prince Hall Free and Accepted Masons, the 100 Black Men of New York, and he helped start the Eagle Academy in the Bronx, which has grown to six schools in New York and New Jersey. He's also a founding member of the board, uh, he's also a founding board member, I apologize, of the Harlem Hebrew Academy Charter School and sits on the board of the New York City Center for Charter Excellence. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our pleasure to commence this panel tonight. It is our pleasure to have Dr. Basil Smickel and we hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Dr. Basil Smickel, you can take it away. Um, thank you, Brother uh, brother Nelson. I'm, I'm actually a little embarrassed. That was a really long bio. Uh, and uh, it also reminds me I need a vacation. But thank you, good brother. And it's good to be here. And thank you so much, Renine, for the uh, for the invitation. It's really great to be with all of you today to really talk about um, an issue that is obviously important to you, but uh, has been uh, really the cornerstone of my uh, career in, in, in politics and public policy, which is, which is activism and advocacy. So um, I want to get right into it because uh, we have a great panel uh, and uh, I want to make sure that you get to hear from all of them on a number of different issues tonight. So why don't we, why don't we get started and I can, I'm happy to introduce them all to you. So let us begin with uh, our first panelist this evening, uh, Raneem Hamad. I did say that correctly, right, Renee? Oh, awesome. Renee is a senior at Columbia University studying human rights and public health. Her journey within activism started in 2017 as a senior in high school, where she founded and co-led a youth organization group named Students, uh, Students Against Hate and Discrimination, advocating for changes that better support Black students in the Iowa City School District. This past summer, Renee founded the Iowa Freedom Riders, a youth-led activist group advocating for justice for Iowa City's uh, uh, BIPOC, Black Latino persons of color and persons of color community through abolition. She also serves as a commissioner for Iowa City's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, birthed from, these tire, from the tireless work of IFR's Black women organizers. Um, next is Francie Lutencourt. Francie is a recent Macaulay Honors graduate from the City College of New York, where he received his Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, magna cum laude, a double minor in legal studies and public policy, while also serving as student body president. He was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, by Haitian immigrants, and has been a consistent advocate for change across New York State. Luton Court is currently a litigation paralegal at Paul Weiss Rifkin, Wharton and Garrison LLP. I do a lot of work with that firm right now, uh, brother. A brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, a founder of a youth-led advocacy organization called Strategy for Black Lives, an appointed executive member of his community board in Brooklyn and an elected member of the Kings County Democratic Committee. It's good to have you with us as well, brother. Um, next, I uh, want to introduce Charlene Cote. Charlene is a second year medical student at the CUNY School of Medicine and a part-time photographer. Charlene first got into activism at the age of 17 through Amnesty International, where she worked with local organizers to advocate for the minimum wage. We now have a $15. Over the years, Charlene has fine-tuned her activism to focus in just advocacy, not just advocacy, but also accurately capturing and recording history. Charlene currently works with a dynamic and trailblazing group of young activists, Strategy for Black Lives, to continue to advocate and demand the necessary changes needed in communities of color. Next, I uh, wanna introduce Colby King. Colby is a junior at Columbia studying African-American studies and psychology. 
He is originally from Dallas, Texas, and has been an avid student leader. In the Columbia Senate, Hoagie serves on the Commission um, on Diversity and the External Relations and Research Policy Committee. In addition, he also serves as Race and Ethnicity Representative on Columbia College Student Council, and he is the Community Outreach Chair for the Black Students Organization. Now we have two others, this Chelsea Miller, this is yet, well, I will, I will introduce Chelsea assuming that she is here or will join us soon. Um, Chelsea is a Columbia University graduate, 24 year old Brooklyn native and one of the leading voices in youth activism. Chelsea is the co-founder of Freedom March New York City, a youth protest and policy group on the front lines pushing for reform across the nation. She's addressed thousands of people in speaking engagements that include Madison Square Garden, Yale University, and most recently, the March on Washington. Her work has been featured in New York Magazine, Forbes, Vogue, CNN, and BET. In 2016, she worked in the Obama White House as one of the youngest interns on criminal justice reform and urban economic opportunity. She's the co-founder and CEO of Women Everywhere Believe, Inc., a national organization training women and girls to be civic and corporate leaders. Her work has been recognized by elected officials and national organizers alike in the space of activism and social entrepreneurism. In 2020, Chelsea was named by the city and state of New York, 50 most powerful people in Brooklyn. Um, and there is one other panelist who uh, I hope will join us soon if he is not already, and that is Dr. Rufus Sadler. Dr. Sadler is currently a medical specialist with the New York City Department of Sanitation. Upon re receiving his undergraduate degree from Columbia in the late 1970s, he attended Howard University, where he received his MD as a student at Columbia University during the Civil Rights Movement and a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Dr. Rufus Sadler has remained engaged as an activist throughout his life. So welcome all of you. Thank you for um, becoming part of this really extraordinary panel. So if there are no uh, questions, I will ask the first question. And I know, by the way, we will have time for uh, uh, questions from um, our audience as well um, after we've uh, had the panel an opportunity to weigh in on some of these pressing issues from the day. So we will leave some time uh, for audience questions. I want to make sure everybody knows that. Um, I want to just throw out a, a, a general question uh, to everyone so that we can sort of hear your perspective on an issue that I'm sure you've talked about a lot. Um, and I want to actually combine two, two, two points here. The first is talk to us about systemic racism and the part that it plays in the work that you've done and in the, in the paths that you've traveled. And how then do you see the power of youth voices impacting that? Um, again, what did, how, how, talk about systemic racism in your circles, in your path, um, in your sphere. And, and then talk through the power of youth voices and how you believe it has or can have impact on that. Why don't I start with, um, why don't I start at the beginning where, where I started with Radeen. Hi, uh, thank you for introducing me, Dr. Basil. That I really appreciate that introduction. Um, and I guess, so in terms of how systemic racism affects, you know, I did a lot of my organizing work in Iowa City um, and just within our community um, in and of itself, there's just not a lot of um, black folk in Iowa City. As you can tell, it's pretty much the Midwest, middle of the Midwest. Um, so a lot of our youth um, are targets to a lot of the brutality and the police brutality that happens in our community. Um, it's consistently targeted. And it was really interesting in that the moment that youth voices started, um, you know, kind of pushing back against this this past summer, that there was a lot of um, kind of pushback from the community, um, whether that be white folk in the community, or I would also even say um, older black folk in the community who thought that we were asking for too much, or um, we were kind of ruffling too many feathers um, and not respecting the general politics that were already existing within the community. Um, and so that was really interesting for me to just kind of learn about that dynamic of how systemic racism is functioning without the, within, you know, even organizing communities that I thought would be supportive um, of this movement that was happening in Iowa City. Um, 
what was the second part of the question? Sorry. <laughs> Just the way that, no, well, I think you sort of answered it already, which yeah. was the way that youth voices have impacted that systemic racism. Yeah. And I know I've been, uh, I've been, uh, I've been to Iowa, so I know Iowa, um, and I've been to New Hampshire, and I'll just say, um, just very briefly, I always tell my students I get my conventional wisdom from Seinfeld, Chris Rock, um, The Matrix, and Star Wars. And I always remember a Chris Rock joke where he was, I think it was in one of his early show back in the early 2000s or something when he was in New Hampshire reporting on the presidential primaries and he said the one thing he noticed there weren't a lot of hair care products for the brothers in New Hampshire I assume the same is true for Iowa yes. but so the yes. question is you know what how do youth voices then kind of impact the systemic uh, racism that you that you've encountered so it's really specifically about the youth voices and the role that they play but you sort of answered yeah. that already yeah yeah I'll let the other panelists share their okay. perspectives as well. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll go to France, Francie because Francie, you uh, you are a, 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 a Haitian immigrant, or your your family is Haitian, is that right? Correct. And I would also I would love to pose I want to pose the same question to you, but also if you can from the point of view. Now my parents are immigrants as well, um, but from the point of view of um, I guess both your life here and is there is there a perspective that you bring as a Haitian American as well? Um, if there is, um, I'd like you to add that to the to the mix. Yeah, so, you know, definitely. Asian, I'm the guy Asian. Could I ask everybody uh, who's not speaking to just make sure that you mute, um, you mute, you, you are on mute to allow um, um, the speaker to, uh, to, to be heard. I think that's the t-shirt for 2020 and 2021. You're on mute. Um, but uh, yeah, if I could ask everybody to just make sure that they're on mute so we can have a clear, uh, uh, a clear conversation. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. So I would definitely say um, systemic racism is something that I've experienced day in and day out, uh, especially coming from Brooklyn, you know, being just the general young African-American male living and experiencing life in New York City. Uh, especially when it comes to just racial profi racial profiling by the NYPD and kind of my gateway into activism was a response to my interaction with the educational system in New York City and public schools. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because since my parents did come from Haiti, uh, you know, they always had the mindset of, you know, we have to work twice as hard because we are Black, because we are where we came from. And you have to understand that no matter what you do, the odds are stacked against you in this country. So you need to spend twice as much time studying and making sure that everything's on point and, and hold your head high and carry yourself with a certain level of uh, tact and cautiousness that isn't afforded, that is a, that is not afforded to, to people that look like us. Um, and because of where they came from, education has been one of the most important things that they stress to me, the importance of getting a good education, performing well in school, you know, going to a good college and whatnot. So when I had that as kind of my background, the points of education, and then I interacted with the education system in New York City and how it was segregated, you know, the racial tensions and the microaggressions and, and kind of the just lack of educational opportunities for people in our neighborhood and people that look like us, it really helped kind of serve as a Kickstarter to, to my activism and the work that I do. Um, and, it's, and I appreciate the fact that you brought up your vo you voice because oftentimes my activism comes from student activism. So I believe that, you know, when it comes to solving problems, those that are closest to the problem are closest to the solution. So when it comes to fighting for better school systems, fighting for better universities, the type of courses that we should be learning, the type of resources that we need to excel and, and, and get our degrees, uh, I believe students need to be involved in those conversations and lead those conversations, especially when it comes to educational policy, not necessarily just sitting on commissions to provide, you know, input, but actively being involved in the policy making process and being sure that the students who make up the schools and the schools wouldn't, wouldn't exist without their voice, their sentiments and their day-to-day -day experience as students is integral to whatever decisions are being made at any level of the institution. Thank you, no, thank you very much for that. Um, I wanna to turn to Charlene. Um, you are in medical school currently, is that right? That is correct. Can you, can you, can you, I'm going to call you doctor because I'll just I'm, I'm going to own it. Student, own it. student. No, student, no, no. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to own it. Uh, I want I'm going to own it and project it on you. Call I appreciate you doctor. that. I appreciate um, that. And you know, one of the things that uh, I'm actually going to ask you this question. I, I'm asking you the same question. I'm going to tee it up because there's another piece of it that I actually want you to respond to uh, in, as a as a medical student. Um, 
My mother just got told that she could get a vaccine today. And she is quite ecstatic uh, because she was really freaking out about, you know, whether or not she could get one. And, you know, a number of people, and I will just say, um, I know 12 people who've died from COVID and some of them were friends of the family. So she knew some of those folks that I, you know, we have those friend, folks in common. Um, a lot of, some of her neighbors have died and gotten sick. So in, I'm asking you the same question I've asked others, but, but from your position or from your vantage point in, in medical school, you know, how do you think about systemic racism given where we are with COVID and you know, the inequities, not just in, how, in, 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 in the disparity and not just how uh, people of color were, um, people of color uh, uh, fared it during the pandemic, but now, even in the vaccine distribution, we're, we're seeing all of these articles pop up about um, even the vaccine distribution in and of itself has become uh, a racialized. Uh, thank you for the question. It's, it's, it's certainly like a, a very loaded question. And yeah, sorry I'm, about that. I'm, I ask a lot of loaded questions. No, that, that's absolutely fine. I, I appreciate uh, a, a good loaded question. But I think that I'm going to start from um, what most people don't necessarily like think about is ask yourself, why is there systemic racism within a sector that's meant to prevent illness or cure people or help people, you know? And so it's like, when you try to break it down, and, and I only have this insight because I'm in the medical system now as a student, is that you begin to understand that, like, that, that the foundation of Western medicine in itself is racist. The foundation of gynecology is racist. The foundation of a lot of vaccines and trials, the Tuskegee trials, and, and even the, I, the fact that like there are people at, at our borders who are being given medication under the pretense of helping them, but these medications are actually sterilizing them. It's happened in Israel, it's happened here in our borders. So it's like at the root cause, the people within it, it's like the implicit biases that we have leads to that kind of like perpetuation of systemic racism. So you're producing doctors who are supposed to work in these underprivileged communities, but these doctors don't even understand the culture of these people. And these doctors don't even understand that there's an issue with their training in itself. So I think that over the time, as time goes on, people are beginning to understand that and people are beginning to know, do things to sort of like assuage that, but we are far from the finish line. And when you look at that, and consider, for example, um, the vaccine trials, right? Or even how COVID went down and the communities that were affected, it is because that systematically our communities are set up in ways where wherever you have the most people of color are gonna be the areas for the food deserts. Let's start with, let's start with that, right? So you have food deserts um, and then you don't have the best public school system. No one wants to go work in your community. You don't have the good resources, right? So you cannot sustain your health because socioeconomically you are challenged. Not because you want to be challenged, but because the system is set up that way to make you, you know, like sort of like be in that, I guess, societal class. So of course it makes sense that in a pandemic or even something small, like an endemic, those communities that have the food deserts that, that don't have enough PPE, they don't have enough healthcare services that they're going to be the most affected. It, it, like, it has nothing to do with the fact that, oh, like you're black, you're more prone to getting COVID-19 or getting tuberculosis or whatever it is just because of your color that does not exist, you know? Um, and then when it comes to vaccine distribution, people with the money are those who are gonna talk. And we have to understand that medicine is a business. It didn't, it might, it might not have started that way, but it is a business. And it's a business that's running on capitalism, which is fueled by systemic racism. So you always come back to this kind of like cycle, right? So because it's fueled by, by money, those with the money are gonna dictate where the vaccines go, right? So the rich folks who can afford it, which is your 1% rich, white, Christian, American man, however they describe them, are the ones who are gonna afford it first. And because they have stocks in, in, in these vaccines and these companies like Pfizer and Moderna, they're going to begin to dictate, oh, like, let's take the vaccines here or there or there, right? It makes no sense that when the vaccines were about to be uh, 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 released, the trials, they wanted to take them to Africa to, try, to, to have the trials there. 
But last I checked, they don't want the vaccines in Africa as a preventative thing until 2022. <laughs> so why do we have to be guinea, guinea pigs, right? But then we don't even get to have the vaccine. Like someone has to think about it, someone has to question that. And it just all comes back to the fact that like at the core of the foundation of what medicine was sort of like made on, it was through the exploitation of black people. And, 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 yeah. I'm sorry. No, and I just wanted to, just to add, because it, I mean, that was, that was tremendous. And I want to just add as, or ask, as a medical student, a young medical student, um, how do you talk to, or I imagine that other young medical students of color are talk, having these conversations, do you find any rigidity or resistance from older, from, a, from a sort of another generation of, uh, of medical professionals? Or, or is there an understanding that's intergenerational? Like there, there's a greater understanding of, you know, the, 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 the challenges that you're, that you're addressing and the problems. I think I see. I think that it's it's that that's a very tricky question because uh -huh. it all comes back to individuals, right? Yeah. So I've met doctors, I've met nurses, I've met clinicians or teachers or people in my school who they are open to learning about culture, different cultures. They are open to changing their ways. And I've met people. I have I have I have like you know people in my class who are racist as ever, and it makes no sense because you you go to school in Harlem, <laughs> and mm -hmm. all your patients are either in the Bronx or in Harlem, or in Brooklyn, you know? And you sit in a class that's like 70% Black. So we are all Black scholars. There's no one in here who is, you know, like, subpar. And mm -hmm. still, you're not convinced that we are in scum. So at that point, it's like, I don't know what to say to you. Like, you've, you've, seen, you've seen us thrive. You've seen us at our best, and you still are very dogmatic about your own way. So I, I don't know what to say to you. But for the most part, I think that the, uh, there's, a, there's a change um, towards this idea that uh, racism is a public health issue. So in that sense, like there's been a change in like curriculum that's sort of like try trying to spread across the states um, where they are trying to teach about implicit bias. They are trying to teach about like the racist parts of medicine and keeping it honest and having have open forums where students can talk about how they feel um, and so on and so forth. But it, it, really, it really comes back to the individual and, and the school. I right. think that I'm, I'm, I'm a bit lucky that I go to a school that's so, I guess, a bit more open to having these conversations, but it's, it's still far from perfect, you know. Okay, thank you. No, thank you very much. Um, let me turn to Colby, you're a junior and studying African American studies and psychology. So uh, talk a little bit about, you know, again, to, you know, as a, the, the question for everybody, which is systemic racism sort of in your sphere, in your circle, in your observations, how and how young people can, how young people are impacting the conversation and changing the narrative or the paradigm. Um, and, you know, I also would love for you to address based on what you're studying and what you're researching, like what is some of the what are some of the points that you've been pulling out of your research that and your studies that have really resonated with you? Okay, um, so for me, activism, community organizing, everything started in the church. I'm a church mm -hmm. boy, through and through. My mom was a minister. A bunch of my family members are pastors. So pretty much my entire childhood was church and school, church and school. Now. Was that healthy? Probably not, but that was what my life was. And so because of that, my family was always adamant about advocating for the community we're in, in, in Houston and Dallas. Those are black places. I only really saw black people. So for me, community meant black people. Um, and throughout my life, you know, I was always doing community service. And then as you get older, you kind of start to realize that no matter how many community gardens you help build or how many homeless feed the homeless things you do um, tutoring things you do something isn't changing and you can't you know do all that alone um, and so as I got to college came in as an engineer because I was like I'm gonna use computer science and chemical engineering to end racism and then I realized like 
that doesn't work if the people that need what you're making can't get it because of capitalism and racism. racism. Um, let's see, switch to African American studies, psychology. Columbia was also the very first time I was at a school that like wasn't majority black. Um, and so, you know, you, you, I, I always viewed racism much more as like systemic than like interpersonal because I never was around other people to like really experience the interpersonal. Then I got to the school and I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> y'all move differently here. I ain't never seen nothing like this before. Um, and so then I kind of just really realized like, but also being here was the first time I didn't feel in place in a black community. I know like Harlem is there, but it didn't feel like that was where I was from. That didn't feel like that's my place to be. And I didn't feel like I had much say in going and trying to save it. Um, so I kind of shifted my focus to policy stuff and specifically policy stuff, both at Columbia, but then criminal justice policy stuff, working at the ACLU and Beer Institute of Justice and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, as far as my studies though, my area of study within African American studies is also religion. Um, and it's because for me, I think so much of black movement building has always been in the church. And I'm not just saying that in the United States, I think that like we can see that in lots of different places um, and not necessarily just the church, but just religion in general. Um, and so I feel like if you can understand why religion has been like such an important community center for black people, you can understand how to continue to build that community, but also the black church has all these problems. We can talk about misogyny, homophobia, classism, all of those things are also in the church. You could argue that a lot of those things extend from the church itself. Um, and those are also problems that have to be fixed. Um, and so understanding where those things come from too, so. No, thank you for that. I, I actually wanted to say, uh... Uh, that I uh, I wanted to just say very quickly. I actually was recruited to Cornell to be an engineer, um, and I didn't. I actually also at, the, at some point decided I have different skill sets and talents. I love math and science, but I, I, I needed to do I needed to do more organizing and mobilizing. So I actually went to the labor relations program because I was really curious and in, 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 in passionate about organized labor. Um, and I know I made the right decision, but I sometimes wish I had engineer's money. Um, so, but thank you so much, Colby. Chelsea, I, uh, hello, thanks for joining us um, today. I read you in earlier, so I, I, did, I did read your bio. Um, and I, um, the question that I had actually asked everybody, this is sort of start everybody out, um, was to, you know, just talk about and, and give voice to your, in your experience, in your circles, in your, in, your, in your movements, how have you seen, how would you describe, talk about systemic racism and the role that youth play in impacting that um, from, your, from your walk? Hi everyone, so excited to be here this evening. Sorry for being late, was coming out of another meeting. Um, okay, so we're hopping right into it, it sounds. The question about young people and systemic racism. So a lot of unpacking there. One of the biggest things that I say, at least within my activism, and, and I know that you read my bio earlier, but just a little bit about me for folks who may have come on after or um, just always good to kind of have my perspective on it. So the way that I talk about my work is that I'm a social entrepreneur and activist, which is important because I think about what does it look like to sustainably support movements and understanding the importance of being able to be in this for the long haul and what does it look like to to ultimately create spaces for young people to lead, but also understand that there is a journey in leadership and there are communities that need to be built. Um, and so one of the biggest things that I talk about within the work that I do as the co-founder of Freedom March NYC is the importance of not only amplifying the voices of Black women on the front lines, but also the importance of sustainably doing that work. And so 
we create policy, we work with um, all different aspects of, of just the world from uh, media on centering the message of the movement when we think about youth activism, but also what does racial justice work look like to um, working with elected officials on policy change. We actually have five bills that will be introduced to the New York State Legislature this year. Um, in addition to that, just training other youth organizers in their communities on what does it look like to sustainably uh, create change through voter mobilization and also working on the ground with a lot of the, the questions that we've been left with around what does uh, criminal justice reform look like and how do we think about this from a systemic level. And so one of the things that I always say is that young people, we are unapologetic. Young people have always been at the forefront of movements. And I think that every time young people kind of make our way to a stage, then suddenly everyone's like, oh my gosh, we never knew young people were so bright and organized and you know, changing the world. And if you look at the history of even the civil rights movement and you talk about Freedom March NYC being rooted in Freedom Summer from the 1960s, you know that Freedom Summer was actually created by young college students who mobilized and traveled down to the South to do voter mobilization. Uh, John Lewis was 23 around the time that he led some of the largest marches and also spoke at the March on Washington in 1963, I was 23 at the time, which was the same age as him when I spoke in 2020. And so there's a lot of parallels between the work that we do now, but also the work that, you know, uh, the folks who have come before us have done and honestly have laid the groundwork for that. And so to that point, I would say that young people, again, are unapologetic. Young people think about what it looks like to reimagine systems on levels that we have to think about and, and really kind of being solution oriented with the understanding that we don't necessarily always have the answers on what it looks like to create change in communities, but rather how do we resource those communities to define change for themselves. And I think that's really important. Um, and then the last part that I would add is I think that our generation is entering a phase where we are definitely not um, subscribing to respectability politics, which I think is also important because if you know the history of past movements and um, even Rosa Parks, right, being the face of the Montgomery bus boycotts, you know that before Rosa Parks, there was Claudette who at the time um, was pregnant and because of that, she was not the face. So there's a lot of, you know, underpinnings to misogyny within our civil rights time and what that has looked like. And I think that it's really important as we enter you know, Gen Z millennials stepping up to lead in the social activism space to really create space for black women to lead, for trans women to lead and really define what liberation looks like at those intersecting points. So I hope that answered your question. That yeah, no, it absolutely did. And I actually want to build on that to ask, get a, ask the panel another question. Just a little housekeeping, as I said, about 7.30, I want to start turning it over to uh, questions from the audience for the panel. Uh, and so uh, in, as, I, as I move toward that, I'm gonna start throwing out questions that anybody can answer. It won't be as formal as the round robin that we just did. Um, but I would also ask that the, that the panel keep the questions to about two minutes or so. So not quite a, not quite a lightning round, but close to it um, so that we can make sure to get an audience question. So um, having said that, I wanna pick up on something that you said, because I think Renim, without using the word respectability politics, kind of touched on that a little bit in something that you, in what you said earlier. So I want to ask the panel generally, um, um, how, how has that, how has the idea of, or your experience with respectability politics, um, how have you intersected that? How, what, what have you been up against? I, I, look, I, I'm 49, I'm about to be 50 in a year. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about me working in politics is that when I thought I was the young buck, I was also viewed as part of the establishment. And I was like, how did that happen? But automatically, one day you just wake up and you're part of the establishment. So how have you, how have you dealt with both respectability politics and, you know, any mention or conversation around this is not how we do things? Because I think you all have touched on that in some way, that we don't do this that way. That sort of that sort of barrier that you might hit. Um, anybody can and can respond to that. But building off of something that Chelsea and Radine earlier said, I can speak a little bit to it. Um, 
I think it was what was really interesting for me um, as like I came up against that barrier every time um, was that the tension that I was having or like that my the Iowa Freedom Riders was having with like older um, you know organizing groups in the community um, was that there was this issue of like you the work that has been done in the community hasn't been isn't being respected um, that the way that we're coming um, with our perspective isn't, you know, honoring the work that has already been done, or honoring the people that have already put in so much work before us. Um, and no matter how much we tried to kind of, you know, figure out that dynamic, it's just people still kind of felt that that was a point of contention. Um, and I think for me, it was really interesting in that the people who helped me get into organizing were now the people that were kind of butting heads with me in terms of like, you're doing things the wrong way. And it really has to be like kind of like a breaking point for me between those relationships and learning how to have like kind of boundaries for myself um, and redefining what organizing and activism meant for me outside of, you know, the mentorship um, from other black activists that I was getting from the community. Because like you said, like somehow, like to me, like they kind of became the establishment at that point. And it was like, now I'm fighting kind of against them in a sense, because like they were a part of this kind of like, or are a part of this like neoliberal culture of Iowa City. Um, and so it's been really, really hard for me to kind of just even navigate that dynamic within like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that um, IFR was able to bring into the community in the sense that a lot of the Black folks who are now part of this commission are part of that kind of establishment. And it's kind of consistently having this like <clears throat> content, this tension between like, are we doing things the right way? Are you guys respecting what has been done before you? And no matter, there's like paternalism that kind of happens. Um, and it's something people just don't think that what you're doing is kind of good for the overall, you know, whole sense of the community. Mm. Anybody else want to chime in? So, to, you know, I, you, you sort of touched on it and I wanted to raise it uh, as a general question for everybody else. So what then has been the role of social media in, in activism today? Because that's one thing that I, I kind of I think I, I I bridge both analog and digital world. Um, you know, I still write things down in a in a, in a notebook. Uh, but uh, I, but what is what is the role of what has been the role of social media? Because and I and I want to bring it back to sort of Colby's point because there have been all of this talk about you know black churches losing congregation. Um, we see that here in New York, even the church where Malcolm X, uh, the funeral took place is de has been demolished and uh, there's a luxury housing attempting to be built on that site. Um, so there's all this conversation about, you know, black church, the, the, the uh, congregations of black church de decreasing, uh, attendance at civic organizations decreasing overall across the board, not just black. But how has, if, if your experience with the black church and what you said about the black church is true, of course I agree with that. How has, what has social media brought to this, to this movement or this conversation? Um, and I'd love everybody to speak to that. Um, I'll hop in. Um, I, think, I think social media and specifically in response to Thomas about the church has destabilize movements and I don't mean that in a bad way I mean that in a good one in terms of like who gets to be at the forefront doesn't necessarily have to be a, a Dr. Martin Luther King anymore you can be a woman you can be gay because they you don't have people that are like actively I mean people still are actively trying to suppress you but it's a much harder thing to do when there's lots of people that can just join at any moment instead of having these entities like churches and institutions that are picking and choosing who they want to lead and how they want things to be done. Um, and even just the idea of leadership altogether, I think is even falling away, um, which I think has to happen if you want to see movements that include all people. Uh, so it's democratized the movement, if you will, a small democratized, right? No? Any other thoughts on that? Anybody, any other? Yeah, yeah, I would really like, oh, build on that yeah. and just say that I think that it has also democratized information and the ability to access it, which has played such a huge role in different organizers being able to build community, right? So you can create a flyer and within a day, it has hundreds of shares or thousands of shares. You can amplify a message. And so I think to that point, there's the ability to really think about how do you communicate your message clearly to an audience? What I will say though, is that when you think about social media, I don't know if anyone has seen the Netflix documentary 
called The Social Dilemma that talks about this idea of essentially existing within a bubble without realizing that we're existing in a bubble. Um, and so there's that detriment that I would definitely say that it's like the sides end up becoming so polarized because you build an awareness on social media that really is just informed by your own opinions and reality. And so as someone who uses digital organizing, for me, it's important to kind of think about what are the messages that other folks are saying that perhaps we're not seeing and how can we think about framing that to counter, right? How can we think about really engaging in dialogue with perhaps like misinformation and disinformation, which also is another huge issue on social media, right? Just because something is viral doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. Mm -hmm. Whereas a lot of times you'll see something and you'll have to fact check it on Google only to find out that like, oh, this was from five years ago and actually like isn't really the case. And so I think that to that point, um, when you think about about movements, it's made it harder <laughs> in certain aspects when it comes to this idea around misinformation. But as far as building community, it's made that easier. Oh, then yeah, Franti, you wanted to speak as well. Right. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I really enjoy the accessibility aspect. I think that when it comes to organizing, apologies, there's some signs like, but um, you know, you know, but pretty much when it comes to social media, I believe it's an asset if properly utilized. I think that traditionally when it comes to activism and change making in politics, there can be some sort of like gateway effect to it as in if you don't fit this type of mold, if you're not you know, a seasoned or experienced political organizer, if you don't have this type of degree or if you don't have this type of stature or credibility or someone else to vouch for you, who are you to let's say lead or who are you to take up space or who are you to use your voice to fight for something that affects us all. So I really enjoy social media because it allows anyone and everyone who believes that they have something to say in regards to fighting for an issue, allows them to have a platform, allows them to take initiative. We're seeing a lot of new leaders and activists that are just people, everyday people fighting for their communities, fighting for what they believe in and for people that look like them. You know, if you look at a lot of times when we talk about activism and people in history, we often forget about a lot of groups and a lot of demographics. We often forget about the work that you know black women did. We often forget about the work that black trans folk did. And I feel like when it comes to social media, we're now allowing more people to use their voice, more people to utilize a platform and for us to learn and do a lot of learning around different people that are fighting for the movement besides what we've already been fed by you know the institution and what's been kind of cultivated and defined as like the activist or the change maker or who has the ability to uh, lead us, even though it's that's not something that's defined or set in stone. It's something that we define for us. And you, to, um, sure, sure. One thing, um, this Francis point made me also think of this is the impact that social media has had on um, just mutual aid and really building community through mutual aid. Um, mm -hmm. I remember like during the protests um, that we had during the summer in Iowa City that like you would post, you know, about someone being jailed or being um, arrested by the cops and like in a matter of two hours, you'd have bail money for that person. And just like the, without social media, I truly don't think that would have been possible. And the amount of mm -hmm. times that we've had to just depend on mutual aid, um, that whole, this whole past summer of organizing was something that I was really, really kind of surprised with and how much of like, the, how quickly the community could band together outside of the systems that were already existing. Um, I mm -hmm. think that's something that's really useful that we should like really capitalize on as activists as we continue moving forward. It's very, very crucial for sure. Awesome. Charlene, you wanted to say something. Yeah, and just to add into that, being that I'm I'm, I'm a part-time photographer and, you know, a lot of times when I'm out um, doing this kind of work, I may be taking photos is that I think that, you know, it's also made, social media has made the world a global village, right? And so when I say that, I, I say that to say that, you know, I can take a photo of what's going on in New York and if I upload it to whatever page it is, someone in Mozambique can, you know, look at it and, and be like, oh my goodness, this is what is going on and vice versa, you know? And so gone are the days when things would happen in secret and people wouldn't be able to shed a light on it and like, you know, like rise up against it. But through social media, we know what's happening in every place at all times. And you know exactly how to organize, how to better organize, I should, I should say. Um, and, and so it just allowed us to see the world for what it is, um, if, if that's kind of like makes sense. But I agree with what has been said so far about, you know, how detrimental that can also be in certain ways. So, yeah. Well, actually, to, to, your, to your point too, you, know, you as a photographer, 
Um, tell me about art and your art in this moment in time. How, how has this affected your, impacted your art? I think that like for me, it's, 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 it's a bit of a rough relationship mm -hmm. because um, there are times when, you know, I, I, I would take a lot of photos, but I don't even want to send them out. I don't want to upload them. I have a lot of photos that I haven't showed anybody, you know, and it, but because I look at them and sometimes it's hard to like look at it and remember what was going on when I took that photo. And then just like think of everything going on like with civil rights now is just like, I, I, I'm attached to my images. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a kind of photographer who I'm involved with my subject. So if I take a photo automatically, I sort of like have this connection, you know, to it because they're important to me. I think that it's not just a photo, like you're capturing someone's emotion, you're capturing what's going on. And this photo is a testament to the truth, you know, and the truth is so powerful. So I'm very careful how I put stuff out there, if that makes sense. And, and so as an artist, I never want my work to implicate anybody. So there was a, there was a time, some in last year when there was you no know, like word going around that the police were going through me, social media to sort of like identify people and arrest them. And once I heard that, I was like, there's no way I'm gonna put my photos because I am not going to get anyone implicated for doing what's supposed to have been done 600 years ago. So, you know, that's not gonna, that's not gonna happen. So I think that it's, it's a bit rough. You know, there are times when I will upload things that I know they're, they're harmless to people um, or the police cannot use against them. Um, but ultimately I think that it's, it's, I don't, I don't even understand how to describe it just yet. I think mm -hmm. it's fairly new to me. I've never done activism in, in photography before until last last year i guess um and so i'm still trying to sort of like understand it and, and process it and i don't think i'm ever going to be able to explain it until maybe 40 50 years from now when i'm like old and gray well you may not well i mean that's art for you right you may yeah. not be able to explain it but i know how i feel when i see it right? yeah uh, that's right no so thank you for that there are a couple more questions that i have um one of the things that i wanted to uh speak on now, I would love for you, you all to speak on, because actually it's a question I ask a lot of my students, you know, in, in my classes, um, and it's something that Chelsea sort of touched on earlier. Um, I always tell the story when I was up at Cornell speaking and I had four hours to kill. Um, what do you do when you have four hours to kill in Ithaca? You get a tattoo. So I was, getting, I was uh, getting, I was talking to the tattoo artist and I always ask, where do you get your news from? And he said to me, YouTube. Um, which I, you know, blew me away, but I get it. Um, and, and I guess in this day and age for, for all of you, uh, where do you get your news from? And how do you discern what is, I don't know, what you want to absorb or what you think is news versus what isn't? Should we even be thinking in those terms anymore? Um, and what advice would you have for someone who is trying to learn and, and study uh, consume information to get a sense of what is happening in the world today and how to make sense of it. What would your advice to them be? Anyone? I think I'll, uh, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, so I think that when it comes to getting your information, getting your news, once again, social media is awesome because everything is out there, but it's incredibly toxic because now there's no filter as to you know what you're getting and 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 I think that Chelsea had mentioned the the documentary social dilemma and and in the documentary you know they explained that these social media platforms have algorithms that watch the kind of things that you like how much time you spend on the post so it's like if all I'm looking at on social media is police brutality the algorithm knows that so day in and day out 24 seven I'm going to be getting similar posts you know. And is that healthy for my mental health? That's not healthy because I cannot be looking at brutal stuff all day long, you know? And so I think that it gets to a time when you yourself, you have to sort of set boundaries. And for me, it's when in the heat of the movement, my boundaries were I'm not going to go on social media before 9 a.m. And I'm not going on social media after 5 p.m. Those were my boundaries. So from 9 to 5, I would be on Twitter or I'll be on 
Instagram, looking at what's going on. And you have to also do your own research and do your own fact checking because everyone will see anything. You know, there are robots on Twitter that are programmed to tweet stuff that aren't even true, you know. And so you have to do your own research and you have to just fact check. And it can be daunting, but you have to also set boundaries in terms of what you want to uh, absorb from the internet and how much you're going to let yourself see because a time comes when all of these visual things begin to affect you mentally and and then you're anxious or you're, you're, you're stressed or your blood pressure is going up or whatever it is. And it's because of what you're feeding your brain. So mm. that's how I, 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 I go about that one. And that is a doctor talking. I told you <laughs> I'm going to own that. I'm going to own that. Um, anybody else have any thoughts? Any other thoughts? So I get my news from, I would say, several places. First and foremost, social media. I feel like that's an <laughs> that's a easy one. And I think that you'd be lying if you said that you don't get information from social media. But I also think that it's important to have kind of like folks who you either A, are in community with or B, or like within your network or three, just people who um, you trust their information that they share and you also trust that they prioritize um, telling the full story. And so for me, I follow social accounts. Like for instance, Tamika Mallory is someone who we work closely with with Freedom March NYC and also just an incredible person when it comes to really unpacking a lot of the issues that are happening. And so I just be following her on social media and be like, what's mm -hmm. Tamika talking about? You know, or or how can I plug into that? And so similarly, I would also add that at least for me, because I do do a lot of media, it's also important for me to understand what the alternative side of conversations are looking like so that I can incorporate that into a lot of the rebuttals that I end up actually saying. And so I do kind of like the fishing on the other side of the internet of like, what are conservatives talking about and how are they framing this issue? How are they talking about the attacks at the Capitol and the domestic terrorism, right? What are the language that they're using essentially to downplay that and that helps me in being able to again like really form right the full picture to then be able to tell at least my vantage point which I think is important yeah you know uh Colby I have a question thank you for that and there's a point I want to pivot uh I want to pivot from because Colby you you are from a very red state I actually did some work in Texas on a campaign many years ago um you are in a, you come from a very red state and you uh, you are in you're in New York now right are you back in New York you're still in New York you are uh, you are in a very blue state right now um, although sometimes not as blue as we want to think it is but that said um, you know what's that been like you know what has there been a, a political culture shock if you will going from one place to another and and I know you sort of talked to, touched on it earlier in terms of the you know the intersection of race specifically um but what what's that been like and what's that been like in terms of what you're seeing what you're reading the news that you're getting and the, the circles that you're in how what's what's changed if anything um okay so i'm actually in baltimore right now oh you're baltimore okay. but well maryland yeah <laughs> oh but i often and i actually like wrote something about this not too long ago I think people get the South wrong yeah. a lot. Um, the South is, again, it's where the majority of Black people in the United States have always been and still are. So like Houston has the fourth largest African-American population in the country. Dallas has the eighth. Like, I grew up with Black people. You know, I grew up with Black Southerners. What? And when I came to, because part of the reason why I did come to Columbia was like, I was like, yeah, I need to get out of Texas and see something different. When I got to Columbia, I was like, y'all still racist. I was like, y'all actually a little more racist. Y'all, this is a different type of racism. Um, and I actually always tell people I prefer Texas because like, at least you know where you're going. At least you know who you're talking to. At least you know what you're getting into. Yeah, actually, it does explore that a little bit. Different type of racism. What is that? I mean, I, I think I know what you mean, but I would love for you to sort of. By that, I mean, like, it's coded in the North. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's hidden. People want to pretend like it's not there. It's much more complicated. Like, the laws are 
more developed in a way that I'm like, whoa, this is weird. Like walking around Baltimore, I'm like, each street is different. You street by street, I'm like, this is not, at least in the South, it's like, okay, the North of Dallas is white, the South of Dallas is black. We know that. It, when I've gotten here, it doesn't, that doesn't happen anymore. It's like, y'all really went through this. Y'all put effort into this in a way that mm -hmm. I never thought could be possible. Um, and I think what I appreciate about the South and what I appreciate about Texas, you know, my little necklace, is that we can be honest. <laughs> we know it's there. We don't pretend like it's not. Um, and when you can be honest about it, I think that's when you can really start to address it. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if there's, there's a lot of states that I think need to be a little bit more honest mm -hmm. about what they are. That's and also, Texas isn't as red as people think it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the last three presidential elections, it almost went mm -hmm. blue. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that, and really it could have went blue if it weren't for gerrymandering, lots of different systemic issues. I'm sure Texas would have been blue a long time ago, just like Georgia, mm -hmm. um, if we really invested in the South the way we should. Right. Um, well, we saw that a little bit with Georgia and, you know, with, and we always talk about Texas as, getting there and maybe if, if you're on that side of the aisle, um, then yeah, that's right. Um, there's a couple of quick questions that I have and then we'll open it up to, to, to um, the folks that are joining us this evening. Um, talk about intersectionality. And I, you've t you all t sort of touched on it and, and spoke on it, um, um, Colby and Fonty. I know that you spoke on it as well, but talk about the role that intersectionality has had on, on the movement um, as, as you've seen it, and, um, and on our politics today, just broadly. Any thoughts on that? I don't mind starting. Please. Um, so intersectionality, I would say compared to organizing uh, years ago, maybe five, 10, or however earlier you would say, compared to now, I would say intersectionality is definitely more prevalent. Um, it's always been something that should be important and included, understanding that struggles are intertwined. When we look at Black Lives Matter organizing that sparked after the George Floyd uh, murder, intersectionality was definitely present in the way that we also had to center, you know, Black women's lives that were lost, such as Breonna Taylor and Black trans folks' lives that were lost, like Nina Pop. So it's important to note that when it comes to organizing around Black Lives Matter, that's why the the new hashtag all black lives matter started growing on social media because we realized that we can't just be out here fighting for black lives and limit it to black men that are fortunately dying at the hands of police because it's more than that um and you know there's a saying where all of us well none of us can be free unless all of us are free so we have to understand that unless we're advocating for everyone including the lowest uh common denominator or the one that has the least amount of voice or access or the ones that have um the lowest expectancy to live or the greatest um, distance in terms of resources that need to survive in everyday life, that we need to do better as a community. And when it comes to specifically Black folks outside of just the intersectionality amongst gender and sexual identity, there's also intersectionality and solidarity amongst uh, different ethnic groups. You know, whether you're African American or you're from Caribbean immigrants or African immigrants, there was a lot of uh, solidarity and, and movement sharing when it came to Black Lives Matter and how protests were happening all over the world after the George Floyd death, as well as how Black Lives Matter organizers were involved in supporting when the NSARS movement was a thing, when, uh, student activi when student activists were organizing for what was happening in Nigeria and so on and so forth. So I think now more than ever, we're, now more than ever, we're starting to realize that no one struggle is necessarily too independent from each other. And that when we work to amplify each other's voices, that provides uh, a better chance of success in making sure that our voices are getting out there. Even right now, even outside of just Black Lives Matter organizing, but organizing in general, one of the biggest organizing demonstrations are happening in world history when it comes to the farmers in India, right? And that's something that we should also use our platforms to elevate because what they're doing also has an effect on Black people, workers' rights, and the right to mobilize. So that's definitely something that is becoming more and more prevalent and has been more successful in the present day movement compared to organizing prior. Sure. Any other thoughts on intersection? Yes, Renee. Yeah, I think it was interesting for me to just see in Iowa City, um, 
like such a predominantly white community is how abolition became kind of a space where like now it's not just like black people fighting you know and saying that we don't want the police in our communities like it's also like poor white people coming and joining the fight and it's like other white people who have struggled with you know the police you know systems and the prison industrial complex in and of itself and it's just been interesting for me to just see how this like how abolition has become kind of a space or abolitionist ideology i guess um today has just become a space where people can come and connect regardless of where they are because they understand how these like oppressive systems affect us all um regardless of whatever communities they reside in um and like in a place like in iowa city there's just not enough black people for us to just have you know our protests be like led by so many black people um and it's interesting to see how many white folks were coming out and actually joining um the conversation and joining the movement and also having having similar ideology um and relating to you know not relating to the black struggle in, in and of itself but relating to the struggle that um we experienced just through the police system in iowa city um so that was an interesting trend for me because like if i was you know just to think of five years you know before that i wouldn't have seen that kind of a a dynamic happening um, within Iowa City, but like it's interesting to see how like youth activism kind of enabled that, um, in a sense, to just have those dialogues across, you know, across cultures, across ethnicities, across races, especially with respect to just police abolition and prison abolition. Yeah. Any other any other thoughts? I wanted to. Oh, Chelsea, please. Yeah, I would just add to, to your initial question about intersectionality. So intersectionality being coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, and a lot of that was rooted right in this invisibility that was happening with Black women and state sanctioned violence and understanding that we can't talk about police brutality without also talking about the abuse to prison pipeline, without also talking about the school to prison pipeline, without talking about the ways that Black women right, have been erased from the conversation. And I think since then, it has taken on a life of its own. And even right now within the movement space, a lot of people, when you say intersectionality, they're like, well, let's unpack that because it's it's become a term that has been so easily thrown around. Uh, but I would say that within my activism and, and how I see it is that really what it's rooted in is, is to Franzi's point, right, of understanding that there are intersections and that it really is on us, especially as you think about organizers and, and young people and however you want to term it, to be able to think about, right, the frameworks that was created through, through the research and ultimately the work of Kimberly Crenshaw and take that and put it into practice. And so a lot of what we're seeing now, at least on the front lines, is that emphasis of creating space for Black trans women to lead, right? And one of the organizations that we have within New York, right, like the Stonewall uh, Process Group, the Queen's Liberation, march like so many different uh trans women coming together to really center the message of the movement and being supported by community in a way that historically um i would say we just need to do a better job at and so i think that as we look to kind of like what's next when we think about the term it's really important to do a lot of learning and unlearning but also mm -hmm. leaning into that conversation and also bring our community into that conversation because there is definitely a lot of um, anti-trans rhetoric within our communities. There's a lot of misinformation about what we mean when we talk about intersectionality. And so there's a lot of work in unpacking that. And, and I can definitely say that even when we think about protect black woman, what that looks like on the front lines and having to check people so many times because there's even folks within this movement who don't even understand what protect black woman looks like and, and means, right? So so all of these things are important when we talk about theory, but also what it looks like in practice. But what does, the, Doug, let me ask you this then, what, as a follow-up, what does that mean? protect black women and what what does it mean to you and then what have you seen that is contrary to that i would say protect black women at all costs i think that what tends to happen is that we say protect black women but there's a silent but that a lot of people um hold on to perhaps within the comfort of their homes or their uh friend group chats but it's like you can't say protect black women without um, also acknowledging the fact that when there are things that come up in like mainstream media, when we talk about what happened with Meg Thee Stallion, right, and, and the response from the community of, oh, maybe she's lying or this, this isn't real or, you know, protect her abuser, essentially. Um, and so what we see is that a lot of folks 
in theory, right, use the term protect black women, but when it's time to actually show up, when there are moments to do so, right, there's that silence, there's that erasure, or there's that doubt that's created. And yeah, we've seen a lot. And I saw that uh, Renee was nodding. So maybe you have anything to add to that. <laughs> no, yeah, I think like, it was really interesting for me to just like, when you said having to check people and like when we would say like protect you know all black women like it's really been interesting to see like people within you know the activist organ like organizing groups communities as well that just are not you know aware educated of like their own biases and their own like prejudices that they have and how that impacts um you know their their work within our communities and just i think it's really important that as activists it's really important to be open-minded and be able to take critique um, I think that's something that's just for myself, like has really pushed me um, in just being a better person to, to been supporting everyone in my community and supporting people in the work that I do. Um, I think without, it's hard to have other people critique you in a space where you think that you're doing so much to fight for, you know, something that you believe is so just, um, but it's really, unless you have that, you know, level um, of thinking, then you can't really move forward and, and make sure that you're including everyone um, in your kind of like what Chelsea said earlier in your kind of discussions about justice. And, and what about allyship in that regard? Like what, a, what does that even look like today? How do you hold your, how do we hold allies accountable? Um, what about, how do we, how, what are the best ways if we can even articulate that for them to be supportive? What does allyship look like to you in these moments, particularly as you're, as you're talking about protect women and realizing that maybe some people come at it from a different place, maybe they want to come at for come at it the right way and don't, and then we have to instruct. Uh, uh, what what does that? So 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 I want to so talk about that. Uh, any or all of you about allyship and and holding them accountable. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, start start that one up, uh, and I'm gonna talk about allyship sort of like within my field of uh, I guess I guess uh, school and medicine mm -hmm. so far. Sure. I think that uh, uh, Renee sort of like got that started in terms of checking people, right? And so one thing that I had I had to sort of like learn is you know how to check people and and how to communicate to people that it's not okay for you to say that to me because of X Y and Z, and I don't have to be the stereotypical angry black fill in the blank. Um, to be heard, you know, and 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 you, you're not going to see me that way because, you know, like, like it's like it's, it's like learning how to sort of like deal with people, like interpersonal relationships, sort of like it's like something that you sort of have to teach yourself and and learn and hopefully pick up as you go, you know, how to check people. Um, but within my own circle, it's like I always tell people that. I don't need you to, and when I say people, I mean like you know, people who don't look like me, you know, I, I always make, make it a point to let you know that I don't need you to love me. I don't need you to like me, um, but you're going to respect me and you're going to respect everyone who looks like me, you, you, you know? So I, I think that that's, that's, that that's a way in which I hold my allies accountable is that if you want to be an ally, I need that respect from you and it's vice versa, I'm gonna give you that same respect. But at the same time, don't just show up and participate with me. I need you to go back into your community, mm -hmm. your community that made you have these ideas up until you, you, you were enlightened and go check them too. You know, when you, when you have dinner with your family and you're talking about, oh, like black people are so savage or black people are animalistic. It's like, that's your chance as an ally to step up and say, no grandma, no granddad, like that's not okay and, and educate them. And so until our allies start doing that within their own communities, there's only so much that we can do. Um, because ultimately it's like racism, in my opinion, is not a black problem. It's, it's sort of like their problem that unfortunately is making our lives a, a, a bit too much difficult at this point, but it's like, they have to check it. And so that's how I hold my allies accountable. Like, cool, you showed up to my protest, cool, you, you held it down, but are you going home to tell people in your community, in your home, in your schools, that this is not okay? Or are you going back to, to just be timid and propagate these same ideas? Mm -hmm. Anybody else have a thought on allyship? Um, I kind of just want to add to what Charlene also said in the sense like, so I've had to like, just 
dietary medicine in general has to really rely on a lot of just white folk to be able to do the work that we do because there's just not enough black youth activists in our community. Um, and I think it's really important just like in the sense of just like being an ally and what it means to be an ally is uh, I've been really appreciative of people who have been in our circles and that they know what they know when to speak and when to step back and to make like in the work that they do like how are they centering black women how are they centering the voices of um black trans folk how are they centering the voices of bipoc um marginal any bipoc marginalized folk, folk before they even you know put their input into the conversation and i think in the sense of being an ally it's really important that you're always asking yourself that question in the sense of who whose voice am I silencing right now by interjecting or by adding my perspective? Um, because, you know, your voice as a white person has always been included in the discussion and dialogue for so long. So just making sure that folks are always asking that question, like whose voice am I censoring and whose voice am I silencing and how can I be a better person in that sense? Mm -hmm. Great. Any other thoughts on allyship? Yeah, so I don't necessarily see allies playing a key role because of the fact that we don't have enough Black organized in our community, because I actually disagree with that. I think that we have an abundance. And to that point, when we think about this movement, a lot of people say, you know, like, this is a leaderless movement. It's decentralized. It's unorganized. And that's just not true. It's decentralized for a reason. When you even look at COINTELPRO, which I'm sure a lot of the folks on the panel here know what I'm talking about, but the targeted attempts right, by the federal government to uh, attack right, civil rights leaders and ultimately discredit the movement and so destabilize the movement. And so when we think about what we are dealing with today as a structure of the racial justice work, I think that it's leaderful. I think that because it's leaderful, it creates opportunities for us to have an approach where we don't necessarily need one way of going about liberation. We can think about it in many forms. And then I would add, when I think about allies playing a part within that framework, I would say that allies ultimately should be comrades, right? Like one of the things that we say on the front line is wake up, wake up, this is your fight too. And so not being bystanders to history, but understanding the fact that we've all inherited, right, this country and we have a responsibility to leave it better. And so showing up and ensuring that you're really, again, amplifying the voices of Black organizers, but also resourcing the movement, because when you talk about proximity to capital, more often than not, it is white folks who have access to that. And so being able to be um, one of the things that we talked about this past summer was if you are a gatekeeper to resources, you, you need to be the person connecting the dots to sustain Black organizers. Uh, so I think all of that is really important when we talk about really solidarity and what we talk about being a comrade in this movement and doing the work. No, thank you so much for that. You talk about history, so I want to bring in Dr. Dr. Sadler, who has joined us. Doctor, how are you, sir? He is Dr. Sadler. I, I see him. Maybe he cannot hear. Um, but let me, until he has an opportunity to chime in, uh, I want to just make ask one more question very quickly, and then we'll go to audience question. Actually, no. Uh, why don't we? Oh, Dr. Sadler, you with us? I'm with you. All right. Now I I read you in earlier, but let me just read your uh, bio very quickly again. Dr. Sadler is currently a medical specialist with the New York City Department of Sanitation. Upon receiving his undergraduate degree from Columbia University in the late 1970s, he attended Howard University where he received his medical degree uh, uh, as a student at Columbia during the civil rights movement and a brother of Alvin Fyle from Fraternity Incorporated. Hello, brother, good to see you this evening. Um, Dr. Rufus uh, Sadler has remained engaged as an activist throughout his life. Throughout his life. Brother, we have talked uh, a lot tonight about intersectionality, allyship, but what we need, based on what Chelsea just mentioned, is historical context. So I'm asking you, good brother, to tell us what, what your experience has been, was, as, a, as an activist, as a student in those days, and how you have maintained your activism since then, particularly in the role that you have now. Well, when I arrived at Columbia in 73, 
the attitude toward black students and me was that we were quota students mm -hmm. and that we really weren't qualified to be on to be in the college but year after year we were there i know we only graduated 25 out of 66 that came out of that came into my freshman class but all of them are doing very well and that um they never seem to give you credit for what you were doing and that you were always minimized as you know unworthy to be here in the first place and and for the work that you would do well for the activism on campus so it was both trying to make sure you carved out space for yourself you know trying to make sure that you i don't know got across that to folks if you needed to, that you deserve to be there. And what about what, I mean, talk a little bit about what that was like. I mean, being in a space not previously designed for us. Back then in those time, in that time period, we've had to create our own support system. So we had the Charles Drew Pre-Medical Society, the Charles Hamilton Houston pre-law society, the Caribbean Students Association, um, the Latin Students Association, and um, the Black Students Organization, all were started around the same time. Um, we were the same people. So we collaborated uh, on, on many activities um, and I remember culminating, a culminating event was the Black Weekend in 1976, where we had Gil Scott Heron and Sonia Sanchez. Wow. Um, we spent all our budget on, on the um, guests. So we went to the Hunts Hi, Point Hello. Market. Welcome back. Um, and bought 51 chickens and three garbage bags full of salad and had eight different varieties of chicken cooked in different people's apartments. So we had New Orleans chicken, we had uh, St. Louis chicken. Um, and everything was, you know, that's what we had to do to sustain the event. And we worked all together. Mm. Can I give you something? My guess is, brother, things haven't changed that much. We're still cooking at each other's homes and feeding, feeding the community as well, right? Um, let me stop there and throw it out to anyone who's joined us tonight. Does anybody have any questions for our panelists or comments? We'd love to keep them quick so to make sure that everybody can get heard. But does anybody have any quick questions or comments? We have a relatively small group, so we can if you just want to sort of just chime in without necessarily raising your hand, but if you raise your hand, that will, you will be recognized. Anybody have a question? Hi, I have a quick question. Sure, please introduce yourself when you do. So. Um, of course, uh, my name is Lyndon Harris. I graduated from Columbia last year in 2020. I'm also a brother of Alpha Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, so very glad to see you and brother Sadler on the line to, today. But um, my question really surrounded around uh, the role that corporations play in activism. We saw a lot of, can you hear me still? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yeah, I think this summer we saw a lot of blackwashing, of a lot of campaigns that were, you know, really trying to like harness the energy of, uh, you know, a moment rather than I think pushing, you know, I think all the energy we had socially, you know, towards the end of um, Black uplift to be like a longer term. And, and I just want to know what the activists on this call have, um, you know, in terms of opinions on where corporations, you know, big government institutions and really capitalism right, okay. written Thank you. large path in, in uh, active. 
Oh, thank you so much for that question. Did everybody get it? I guess the role of large corporations, the private sector, perhaps uh, broadly in, in activism and movement. Anything? I think, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get that started uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to keep it uh, short and just, you know, answer that in the sense of, you know, once again, like money controls a lot of things. And so um, for, for activists, you have to be also careful where your funding is coming from, like, you know, what, what corporation is giving you money? Because the moment that you sort of like begin to get funds or get funded by these corporations, yes, it's great. You may have access to a lot of uh, uh, revenue or a lot of uh, money for things that you want to do. But um, are you reading between the lines to see if that corporation is expecting you to do something that perhaps it doesn't fall in line with um, your, the mission statement of your organization? Um, and so once again, that kind of comes back to individual individual activism uh, organizations is that um, when you do go out to partner up with these organizations, it's just we have to do our own diligence and making sure that we read between the lines and you're not being, uh, money is not being used to get you to do something that may not benefit your community or something that may take you away from um, what you have, what you have set as a plan to reach the finish line being justice, you know, so, yeah. Any other thoughts? Chelsea? Yeah, so I would add to this. So as someone who has also come from the world, well, I would say I came from, to be honest, I spent some time in corporate America, um, working specifically on social impact. What I would say is that it's important to use the resources, but don't let the resources use you. And I think you have to be intentional about what exactly those partnerships look like, what are the guidelines around those partnerships, and ultimately, what does it serve, right? There is a cost benefit that you have to do with every relationship that you get in in life period. And I think that it's really important for activists, especially activists who are building out organizations, who are building out PACs, who are building out insert whatever here to develop a business acumen because we do live in a capitalist society. And until that changes, we are operating within the constructs of a certain type of reality that we have to be intentional about. And so what I would say is to really make sure that you're doing your research, to really make sure that you are putting these companies to task and also thinking about what do sustainable and long-term partnerships look like that ultimately will benefit the work and not necessarily just doing something for a check, but rather what are the parameters and what exactly is going to be kind of like the messaging and ultimately the, the long-term win. And so that's really important. I would definitely say that through this past summer, a lot of brands have reached out to work with me. Um, a lot of them who have said no to just because, you know, it's a different type of relationship when you're just using an activist or an organizer for a brain trust, right? Or just to launch a campaign versus all of the other internal work that your company needs to do as well. And so I think that's really important that if a brand does reach out to you or if a company does reach out to you or even an organization and same thing with elected officials because everyone has their own self-interest in mind that you're being intentional about what those relationships look like and ensuring that it really is for that long-term goal. Less hands in the pot is always better. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts around that question before I go to? All right, any other questions from uh, for our panel? Yeah, I have a question. Um, hi everyone, I'm Monica. I am a junior in Columbia College. And currently I am a part of, the, of a on-campus group called Sankofa Zedek. And it works with, um, it deals with like solidarity between and activism um, in the black and Jewish communities. And this week we've been working with um, activists, um, black um, justice activists of the past, um, like um, Minnie Jean Brown, who was one of the um, Little Rock Nine. And also, um, I can't remember her name, but her name was in Ingram and she was a su survivor of the Holocaust. And they have mentioned how um, they kind of feel like some of the injustices that have happened recently are basically like, perpetuating what they fought against and they kind of felt like um, their work was in vain, like all of their, their lifelong activism um, was for nothing. And I was wondering if any of you have faced any scrutiny from older activists um, and do you feel any pressure 
to, I guess, maybe um, overperform at any times. Hmm. So just to be clear about the question, why do they feel as though their life's work was for nothing? Um, from what I understand, what they explain, like, even though um, the injustice that, like, but the new rock nine, like the integration of schools isn't as prevalent, but like, um, for instance, the murder of George um, Floyd, it's like, even though um, it's not a whole bunch of things, it's still the presence of such injustices make them feel like they um, failed. I don't exactly, other than on those dances, know exactly why. I get the question. Okay. Any any thoughts on? Yeah, I can respond. Sure. So I I wouldn't say that I've necessarily had any experiences where an older activist um has been kind of like disappointed or felt any pressure. Uh, when it comes to my relationship with older activists and those that came before me, the biggest thing that I try to preach and share with other organizers the importance of just being able to take a step back and learn from those that came before us because they have done this before they have paved the way they have used a lot of strategies and methods that we can use and oftentimes we try to reinvent the wheel or you know sometimes organizers or activists that are new to this can have like a sort of like oh like i'm just going to do it my way and my way is the best way and this way is the way that's going to help us achieve liberation when oftentimes you know organizers from the 60s the 70s those that came before us from different movements from even across the world have fought you know state sanctioned violence have fought against police brutality and we can learn a lot from them in order to build on that type of work you know oftentimes people will say like oh it's a it's a, it's a movement not a marathon or it's a moment not a movement or however you want to say but basically talking about the importance of longevity right and the importance of knowing that things are not going to change in a day or a year and that instead of us constantly trying to rebuild uh Oh, did uh, Franz freeze? Franz freeze. Uh, okay. Why don't we go on to? I just wanted to add one thing to okay. that question in terms of the um, like the longevity thing that Franz was speaking about, making sure mm -hmm. to not overwork yourself in the sense that like this work is never going to be done. Like there's always going to be some injustice that you are going to have to fight against as an activist um, in whatever sense that you are working in. Um, and so just making sure to be able to like have that like self-care and that like love for yourself in the sense of like knowing when to take breaks and knowing when to just be like, I can't fight this fight in this moment right now and I need to just focus on myself. And that in and of itself is, you know, fighting the fight. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've had to kind of learn that the hard way and that I was over exhausting myself and to the point where I literally just could not do anything anymore. And that really wasn't productive for the movement in any way. And so just really learning how to step back to make sure that you're taking care of yourself as a person. And that's also really important, I believe. Yeah, and then I just wanted to quickly jump in there to say, it's important to be clear on what impact and a win looks like for you, right? Because also understanding like no one can give you the definition of what your liberation looks like. I personally feel like everyone has their own personal journey and understanding of what liberation means to them and the work that is required, as long as it's not detrimental to community and to others, then do that. And so in that same way that I think that sometimes to Raneem's point, we put right all of this energy into community without prioritizing ourselves and understanding that you can't save the world without first saving yourself and understanding what that looks like. And so I think that there definitely are activists who, you know, not even older activists, young activists, black activists, brown activists, right, who, who deal with that, who deal with either A, imposter syndrome, who deal with either be feeling like they're not doing enough or feeling overwhelmed, dealing with depression, dealing with housing insecurity, like it all runs the gamut. And so it's so important to prioritize what success looks like for you and like what working towards that liberation looks like. Some people end up going into academia and they say, you know what, I wanna teach the next generation because I wanna empower the minds who will ultimately create change. Some people end up being on the front line. Some people end up being artists because they wanna capture the movement for generations to come, right? Like there are so many different forms of activism and I think it's so important for us to demystify that and also not put expectations on what that looks like for other people. Good point. 
And the other question is, uh, Zuzi, did I say your name correctly? Apologies yes, you did. did Thank okay, you, wonderful. Zuzi, yes. Um, hi, I'm Zuzi Negrinithi. I'm a junior at Columbia University. Thank you all for this panel. Thank you for the discussion. It's been great listening in. Um, I'm a deaf Black woman, and a lot of the time when trying to participate in programming and, and, and marches and whatnot, a lot of the time there's not kind of accessibility for the deaf community. Um, so, I, But I know that's changing, and I know a lot of people are doing the work to kind of transform that culture. So I wanted to know what are some different ways you create accessible spaces in your work um, for the deaf community, for the blind community, and, and you know, for other communities, um, similarly. That is an amazing question um, because I've never, you know, not, not, not that I've never thought about it, but I've never like given it thought and, you know, in, in the sense of what can I do to, you know, create that space aside from um, 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 aside from like holding the door for somebody, someone who needs the door, the door to be held from and stuff like that. And I think that that's definitely something that I'm gonna go back and see how best I can maybe create a space for people who may, may need uh, additional assistance. Um, because looking back to let's say times when you're in a, in a march, right? If there's an announcement going on, it's, it, it's as easy as maybe finding someone who could sign or, or finding ways to communicate to people who may not um, uh, uh, hear or see and so on and so forth. But that is an amazing question and I'm definitely gonna do some work on that and figure out ways or, or to incorporate into like my everyday life to you know, be more inclusive of those who may not be uh, abled, as abled, I should say. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I was gonna say on the internet intersectionality point, I think the one people always miss is ableism. In general, I miss it all the time. I'm not gonna pretend like I don't. Um, I don't think people think about it unless it affects them or they have someone really close to them that it affects. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. It was something that we should have talked about earlier in the conversation. As for me, I write more than anything. I think that's where I've shifted most of my activism. I hate that very personally, <laughs> but too, um, just because that's what I like to do. But then I've realized that not everybody can read what I write. So, and having to figure out what that means. And I think it's a complicated, not a complicated um, conversation, but it's something that people have to think about intentionally. Um, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Zuzi, uh, oh, I'm sorry, anybody else? Yeah, I just quickly wanted to add this one because I think it's a really great question. Uh, first and foremost, I think that to the point, absolutely, it's the, it's ableism is something that folks miss a lot. I would say that, I don't, I don't know if this is maybe just like New York <laughs> organizers, but one of the things that we actually did have during our Juneteenth uh, demonstration was someone who did sign language as we were uh, on the front lines and and I think that's really important for us to think about ways to do more of that. I would also add that even when we think about ableism through the lens of the pandemic, a lot of folks were outside, but there were also a lot of folks who really could not be outside. He is three minutes away. I gave him a call. So, Sorry. Okay, good. No, no, go ahead. Um, yeah, there was also a lot of folks who couldn't be outside, right? And so understanding that like there are some people who because of disabilities or perhaps because they are more high risk because of COVID-19, right? And so because of that, there were a huge portion of the population who could not participate in the protest, even though it was still one of the largest protest movements of our time. And so that's why I think it's really important when we think about going back to my point about activism and that looking so different, that there are folks who have podcasts dedicated to like unpacking racial justice. There are folks who write books. There are folks who um, do digital content creation. Uh, so I think all of the ways of essentially like bringing the movement to the attention of people and, and thinking of really creative ways to do that is important. And I would definitely say that like social media has helped in being able to do that a lot, at least from what I've seen. Well, thank you. Um, Susie, are you still there? I am, yeah. Is, and, and I would love to know maybe if, you, if there are any best practices or things you wanna share with us that could help us make sure that, um, that folks are paying attention to it. 
Right. Um, thank you. So I, I think one key one is an accessibility report. Um, so before a march, before an event, before anything, just kind of setting something out to a list of people who will be attending to say, here are the here are the exits, here are the um, instructions, here's what's going to go down. Um, if you don't have the ability to have, say, a captioner, if it's virtual, or, or someone to interpret if it's physical. Um, so just giving people that prior notice that like, hey, this is what's going on. And also just like um, kind of overemphasizing and overemphasizing again is obviously, um, it's actually an ableist term, but overemphasizing that like, hey, I am, I'm this person, I'm a black woman with long hair and you know, I'm standing um, by this. And it's like, it's like things people overlook, right? Because it's like, okay, you assume everyone is a seeing person. So everyone should be able to understand that, be able to like fully participate. Maybe a, hey, I'm this person, I'm speaking, I'm done speaking. So that if there's a captioner in the room, they're able to kind of follow along. So I think captioning is huge. I think interpreters are huge. Accessibility reports are huge. Um, on top of that, maybe having someone who's in charge of like accessibility and whatnot so people know who to go to um, um besides that just like making sure that all of your items are optimized online um in terms of like again captioning again any like visual cues etc that's wonderful but i can send i can send more <laughs> no that'd be great if you could send that around to the organizers and make sure that all that uh, that information gets out so thank you very much thank you any other any other questions? None. All right. What I'll do is a question in the chat. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Please. We actually have two of them, I guess. Now. Two. Okay. Um. In the chat here. Okay. How can students, whatever their race or ethnicity, get involved or contribute to the movement? Um. Any thoughts on that? I think the best way that you can contribute to the movement in a sense is like figuring out where you can contribute in your local, like locally, like before you even think of like the national perspective, like what is happening in your own community that you can have an impact on, whether that be like your student community or like your larger like neighborhood or your city, like what can you, you know, put your, involve yourself in that can push the movement um, forward? Because every one of those little pieces, you know, moves that, the movement a little bit further. So I think that's like where people, I feel like people always want to get involved in like a national perspective, but figuring out, you know, where your local, um, the ways you can help locally is really important. Okay. Any other thoughts? No. I mean, also, um, education in general, um, and I don't mean like, I think at Columbia people get theory heavy and it's like if you didn't read how to be an anti-racist, you don't know anything. I mean, like, and you can do those things, but also I think talking to people is important mm -hmm. and talking to real people and meeting people and getting to know what they're going through. Mm -hmm. But you don't know that if you don't ask. True. Absolutely. Um, one question for, um, uh, for the student organizers, do you feel more supported by the administration at Columbia? after the movements last summer, which actually leads me into another question. What do you think has changed at Columbia since then, if at all? I mean, we've been to obviously a tough environment and not everybody's in New York. So I guess to the extent that you've interacted with the university since COVID or during COVID, what is, has, how has the, the administration been supportive or not? And what has changed, what noticeable changes have you um, have you encountered, if at all? So, okay, so I'll go. <laughs> perhaps uh, not. <laughs> I can go. Um, wait, let, let me think about what I can actually say. Um, having I work in the university senate now, right? So I, you know, and I'm on the I'm chairing the diversity commission, and so. I'm always in conversations. I can't say too much because it's all confidential, but which is probably, anyways, I will say that there are people who I think are more supportive. There are other people that I think want to appear more supportive. There are some people that I think are just gonna not talk so they don't seem unsupportive at all. Um, and I don't think 
much has changed. I'm not sure if, if anything will. Um, and yeah, I'll end there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any other thoughts on, on that? I'll add to it. I mean, I'm not from Columbia, um, so I'll speak about, you know, going to City College and then into King's of Medicine, which is at CCNY altogether, um, is that I think that uh, did, did I feel more supported? Unfortunately, not as much as I would have liked to have felt. And it wasn't just me, you know, like it, it was the entire Black community at my school, which is like, do you feel supported? No, but it's like, we haven't been supported for a while now. And, and, and the something that we say that uh, just because you got into the school, that like, yes, the school was made for you, you got into it or whatever it is, but it's not, made, it's not meant to retain you. And so by giving us this kind of support, they're allowing us to be retained because things like this affect how we perform academically. So when they give us this support, when they create these forums, us actually address these problems, things start to get a little uncomfortable because now you're, you're calling out like Mr. This or Dr. Professor or this and that on their behavior and they don't want to hear that, you know, um, and, and, and students are even afraid to speak up because it's like, I don't want to be the only one who speaks up and, and, and gets blacklisted or, 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 or it's like sort of like turned down from certain opportunities and, and unfortunately that kind of happens, you know, behind the doors in academia and the higher you go, the more you see that like that support um, I'm not gonna lie, like it's not really there. And from my own experience, because I served in student government for a long time, is that you sort of have to push and you guys have to come together and make the administration listen to you. Like it's been times when I would tell my dean exact or I, I would tell the dean of the school exactly what the students need and what has to get done. Does it get done? Maybe not all the time, but the most important thing is that you don't allow the administration to triumph over your voice. Like don't let your voice be buried. And it's important to sort of like pass down that fire to the next year and the, and the year below it within the black community because um, that's the only way that we can get some kind of support is if we open our mouths and fight for it and ask for it. But there's only so much that one person can do because I'm at the point in my school when, where I'm not even involved in student government anymore. And that's because I want to protect myself as well, because I'm getting to the point where it's that I'm scared of the retaliation. And, and I hate to, to use the word scared because I fear no one except God. And that's what I believe in, but it is what it is. And so now I'm looking down into my younger peers who are rising up. I'm looking to mold them and to show them the ways that they can also take up the, the torch. Um, but that's just from my experience at a different institution, so yeah. Right. And I wanted to add something that Charlene also brought about, like this idea of passing down the torch is that especially at Columbia, like their administration is really good at just like using the strategy of just waiting out students, like they'll just wait for people to graduate and like the topics or whatever, like demands that students are asking for it just be like kind of forgotten about. I think it's really something that we struggle with just as a community is just making sure that this torch is passed down from generation to generation of students to make sure that the demands that, for example, like a bunch of student orgs um, made a list of demands um, this past summer um, for the university. And so like, for example, like that could also be something that we as a community make sure is passed down and the torch is passed down, like Charlene said, to make sure that we, there's a sustainability that Chelsea was talking about earlier um, and that the movement is sustained across um, time. So yeah. Sure. Um, thank you for that. We are just at time, but I would want to throw out one last question just to kind of wrap us up and uh, it actually sort of touches on what you just mentioned, which is, um, I know that oftentimes we're, folks are asked, them, what would you, what advice would you give to the next generation? So I'm going to ask a different question because I'm the faculty member here. What advice would you have for the older folks among us? How could we be better at us? listen to us <laughs> i mean like like you know it's i think that and 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 i think that i was having this conversation with my aunt the other day in the sense that when it comes to the idea of like deference or some kind of hierarchy it's 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 almost like no you're a child sit down you listen to me and you be quiet based on what culture you're from now i'm african so that's heavy in my culture you know but just because i'm younger doesn't mean that 
you know, my ele the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top. You know, I can do critical thinking too. I can uh, provide solutions. I can give you ideas and together we can make something even stronger. You know, we can combine my youthfulness and my drive and my strength and my novel ideas with your wisdom and your experience and together something can be great. So just listen, you know, like listen, listen, listen to us and, 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 and love us and, and keep sharing with us advice that you think will sort of like boost what we are doing because in the day when we come home we come home to who like our parents and our parents that's the older generation um and so we do need that support we need that encouragement um and and just hear us out you know don't 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 shut us out um because it's it's, it's a long process and it's only going to get sort of better if we can combine all of our forces okay any other anybody else want to I'll keep it short. I would say don't just be a teacher, be a student as well and be a resource. I think that it's really important for us to remember that there are absolutely things that we can learn from the past. And so I don't think that it is wise to discredit the older generation and the experiences that have shaped their realities because truth be told, history repeats itself. Mm -hmm. But in that same way, I think it's important to be adaptable to the new generation and understanding that there are differences. Um, and then to that last point of being a resource, a lot of times, you know, um, even when we're thinking about legacy civil rights organizations are the gatekeepers to the resources that young people oftentimes need to be in the rooms to not just necessarily having someone who can be an advocate, but being an advocate for ourselves and being able to really articulate and be in the, you know, be at the table where the decisions are made. You know, we don't just need representation, like we need to physically be there. So yeah, okay. that's my advice. Absolutely. Anybody else, any other thoughts? No? Um, oh, Kobe, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say kind of to Chelsea's point is, and I mean, like not only are we learning, should they be listening to us? I mean, I think we also have to listen to them, um, but they have to be honest, right? Like they were having the same fights about colorism, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia. They had all those fights. Those things aren't new, right? And so like, if we pretend like they didn't have those fights, that's why we think that they're new fights and it's like, no, they've been here. If we could be honest with ourselves, you know, as Black people <laughs> collectively, you know, then maybe we can actually make progress and not be fighting over the same things 100 years later. Absolutely. Any other thoughts? Okay. All right. Well, everyone, first of all, thank you so much uh, uh, for inviting me to moderate today. My Thanks to uh, the Sisters of Delta Sigma Theta and the, my good brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated and all the Divine Nine, who um, a shout out to all of them, but to all the organizations and students that support the work that, that all of you are doing as panelists. Um, uh, I hope that we continue in that fight and that effort and I hope we see each other as allies. So again, thank you all very much and have a good evening and good luck for those still in school. Thank you. Have a good Thank night. You.